risks. Risks. Okay. Yeah. Risk. Huh? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, those things keep changing, you know. I mean, first I appreciate the risks that you took in coming here, you know, and uh, the survivors after this long day, it's already, you should, uh, you have some medals for everybody here? Uh, okay, now this talk, this is a conference on algorithmic game theory. So this talk has no game theory, first of all, okay? It's one person game. One person is not a game for game theorists, yes? It's decision theory. So you'll say it's computer science. Well, this talk has even less computer science. There's nothing to do with computer science, OK? So why am I here at all? Well, it's Noam and Michal told me, you have to talk about something new, something that nobody knows about, and uh, rather than think that people may know something. So that's what I'm going to do. And in fact, where is Tim? He's not here, but I'll quote Tim when he said, you know, one of the first times I met him, he said, you know, we computer scientists, to get into a field, we take it over. So this is an invitation. Please take it over, OK? <laughs> OK, so uh, comparing risks. OK, uh, forget all this. Uh, by the way, it's all on my web page, uh, relevant papers and presentations and everything. So if you're really interested, you are welcome to go there. Don't go to the jokes. It's dangerous. <laughs> yes? I'm glad you learned something from computer science. Well, okay. Uh, okay, so what are the objects I want to talk about? Gambles. Some people call them bets or risky assets or, you know, there are various things. What's a gamble? Okay. Uh, this is a gamble. With probability one half, you gain $120. With probability half, you lose $100. Okay, or shekels or whatever, euros or whatever you want. That's a gamble. So what I'm talking about are, uh, uh, so those numbers, first of all, one should understand them as net gains and losses. So that's an addition or, or subtraction from your current wealth. Uh, to make it interesting, and believe me, that's an interesting case. What I'm talking about, the rest is, relative, is trivial. We are going to assume that the, that the expectation is positive. So expectation here is, uh, is $10. Yes, I hope you can compute that even at 6, 5, 15 p.m. Okay. Also, there are there is a possibility, there is positive probability of having some loss. Uh, I mean, uh, gambles where you can only make money. If you don't know what to do with them, bring them to me. I'll take them off your hand anytime. Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, also, just to emphasize that we are talking about what, what's called pure risk, where probabilities are known. Okay. That's we start from the very simple case, very classic case. Okay. Now, we want to compare risk, which means the following. Take two objects like this. Take G and H, which are two gambles like this. And question, which one is more risky? Which one is less risky? Okay? How do I compare the riskiness of those, of those creatures? Okay? So uh, that's a good question, because there is no clear answer. Okay? But here's an idea of an answer. Let's take people that hate risk. Okay? They have a good name in economics. They are called risk-averse decision makers. Okay? That much you know. OK, very good. Uh, some of you, at least. Okay? And let's see what they hate more. Whatever they hate more is clearly more risky. OK? Very easy. OK? So the answer is, when is G less risky than H? When risk-averse decision makers are less averse to G than to H. Now, less averse than, less, it, it's complicated. Yes, all these negations, you know. But uh, OK, so in short, when people that hate risk hate G less than H. Okay? You know the story about this uh, lecture in logic when the speaker said, you know, twice, it's very funny because twice negation is positive, but twice positive is not a negation. And someone in the back of the room said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, never mind. Uh, OK, so the question is, how do we make this operative? How do, you, do we put some content into this? I mean, it's a nice saying, you know, but we need to put some content, OK? So how do we translate this sentence that risk-averse decision makers hate G less than they hate H? Those are people that hate risk. They don't like risks, but, you know, some risks they hate more. OK, so the first attempt is very simple. If every, every decision maker who is risk-averse prefers G to H, then clearly, G is less risky than H. Now, what does this mean? Well, the way that we are, the, the, the world in which we are, is the von Neumann-Morgenstern 
classic world where okay, uh, decision makers have a utility function u that translates money into utils. Okay? So u of x is the utility they get from amount x of money. And w is the current wealth, how much money they have. G, remember, is a net increase or net decrease to wealth. So W plus G denotes whatever wealth they will have, either W plus 120 or W minus 100, depending what the outcome of G is. Then they apply to this the utility function and translate this into utils. Then they take expectation, probability a half plus 120, probability a half minus 100, and they get what's called the expected utility. Okay? And so this is the way they evaluate the gamble. Somebody whose utility U evaluates the gamble G when the wealth his wealth is W. This is how a utility uh, decision maker with utility U evaluates the gamble H when the wealth is W. If for everyone, ah, sorry, one more thing. What does risk aversion mean? How do we express the fact that people are risk averse? People are risk averse means that if you give them a gamble or give them the expectation of the gamble, they will always take the expectation. So rather than taking plus 120, minus 100, half, half, they will take the $10 for sure. Now, that condition translates trivially into the concavity of the function u. It's exactly the same. So risk aversion just means u is concave. Okay? So from now on, all the u's are going to be concave. Of course, also increasing, that goes without saying. Uh, but the risk aversion is concave. So if every concave utility function and every wealth w, for every concave utility function and every wealth w, we have this inequality, means everyone, when given a choice, or every risk-averse decision maker, when given a choice between G and H, prefers G to H. Well, clearly that means that G is less risky than H. H is more risky than G. Okay, now if you think this is a new invention, it's not. This is an old invention. It's called stochastic dominance uh, since the 70s. Uh, and uh, this is called the G stochastically dominates H of the second degree. And let me just, uh, okay, I'll spend two minutes just to tell you what stochastic dominance is because it's a very nice concept. Um, okay, so let's start with first degree. Okay, uh, I won't get to third degree, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so I'll give I'll do this by example. Okay, so look at this gamble and look at, look at this gamble. What's the difference? This gain of 150 has become now 200. Clearly, everybody, in fact, every utility function that is just increasing is going to prefer this to this because the utility of 200 is bigger than 150. So some gain has increased. That's stochastic dominance of first degree. Sorry. Uh, forget that. Uh, this is also, here, a loss of 100 became a loss of 120, which is worse. So again, you have the same thing. Okay? This is an exercise. Uh, it looks different. Uh, what I changed here is probably is half half to a third two thirds. Now, uh, shouldn't be too difficult to realize that I take 200 with probability a six from here and make minus 100 with probability a six here. So it's probability a 6, 200 becomes minus 100, which is clearly worse. Okay? So this is exactly first order stochastic dominance. You move things, so domination means moves, moves things to the right. Higher gains, lower losses. Okay? Clearly no dispute about that. How about second order, second degree? Ah, sorry, to get used to the buttons. What second degree? This is a second degree domination. Second degree domination, what we have here, we have the, the gamma that we had before. Now here, instead of getting 200, it's probability a half. This a half becomes now a quarter 250, a quarter 150. So I replace the sure 200 with a lottery, half, half, 150, 250, which clearly anybody who is concave, namely risk averse, doesn't like. They'd rather get the 200 for sure. That's called a mean preserving spread because it preserves the expectation, but we are spreading, okay? That's again something concave utilities don't like, okay? That's exactly what second order stochastic dominance adds. So to put everything together, uh, okay, second order sto stochastic dominance means that we have higher gains, higher losses, or less lotteries. That's okay. So our criterion clearly is good because it gives us something that is obviously right. Okay, it's also really gambles that are less risky. If they always give more gains or less losses or less lotteries, they are clearly better. Okay? What's the problem? The problem is that this is a very nice order. Nobody disputes it, okay? 
but uh, it's very partial, which means most gambles I cannot compare. Give me a pair of, gam a pair of gambles, Usually, I won't be able to say that one dominates the other because I'm not going to have this. I won't be able to find the sequence of operations, as I told you, to go from one to the other. Okay? Most pairs of gambles cannot be compared. So this is a random pair of gambles. I hope it cannot be compared. At least I just put some things. I don't think you can get from this to the other with any transformation. And if you can, I'll change the numbers. Okay? So, <laughs> so uh, believe me, most numbers you'll put down it won't work. And if you add three or more outcomes, then no hope for the problem. Okay. So the question is, OK, is this the end of the road? OK? No. So, uh, so, so let's now uh, add another ingredient. When somebody offers you a gamble, you know, unless you are a compulsive gambler, you can say, no, I don't want to take the gamble. Now, so now let's add the, the, the option of rejecting a gamble. So when is somebody going to accept or reject a gamble? That's very easy. So if I offer such a decision maker with utility u and Wells w, a gamble g. He looks at the expected utility gets from, from accepting. He looks at the utility he has if it stays put at w and compares. If it's higher, he accepts. If it's lower, he rejects. And I put the equality at rejection, doesn't really matter. You just uh, put it wherever you want. Okay? So if you get more utility, you accept. If you get less utility, you reject. Okay? Now, let's go back to our problem. Now, suppose that uh, you are offered g and h. You are not going to accept neither g nor h. Now, does it really matter that the expected utility of g is higher than h? Anyway, you don't take them, so who cares? So this suggests another way to translate this sentence that we want to translate or to make operational, that risk-averse decision makers are less averse to g than to h, in just saying they reject g less than they reject h. They reject h more than they reject g. What does this mean? Anytime they reject g, they also reject H, but not necessarily the converse. Okay, so I'm again I'm now translating this thing in saying that that the rejection of H, the set of rejections of H includes the set of rejections of G. H is rejected more times than more often than G. Okay? Uh, this is this part of the talk is completely conceptual. Forget any formulas, forget any assumptions. There will be a slide that will make everything into correct mathematical theorems. But don't think about that now, OK? I, I'll make it, I'll tie out all the ends, but now it's conceptual, so forget that. OK, just think, satisfy whatever assumptions you want, OK? And then we'll see what we really need. OK, just, but think about the concepts. Yes, I don't want to get into the, well, there'll be a slide on that. Don't worry. Or worry, but you know. <laughs> OK, so uh, if for every concave utility U and every Wells W, we have that if G is rejected and H is rejected, means H is rejected more than G. Okay? So that's a clear sign that H is more risky. It's rejected more times. Okay? Now, if you don't like words, you can always look at formulas. Well, it says exactly the same. I mean, here there is no advantage to using you know, formulas or words. It says exactly the same. But perhaps, perhaps this will help you to realize that if G stochastically dominates H, it means that this thing is above this thing. So if G is rejected, then automatically H is going to be rejected because this is an even lower number than this. Okay, so this thing, which I'm going to call acceptance domination, is an extension of stochastic domination. Whenever we have stochastic domination, we have acceptance domination, but we may have more things. Okay? How many more? Okay, uh, sorry. Okay, now how many more? Turns out, there are some things, in fact, there are even some interesting things that uh, suddenly we realize some new things that stochastic dominance never told us, some universal properties that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but it's still a very partial order. I mean, it adds a little, but not much. Most pairs of gambles you still cannot compare even with this. Now, why is that so? Let's try to understand. Because what is the requirement? Yes, let's go back to this slide. The requirement here says every instance Instance means a utility function u and a west w. The g is rejected. In that same instance, I want h to be rejected. Now, that's a, a quite restrictive condition. For example, suppose the g and the h have very different values. You know, g is in hundreds and h is in thousands or millions. So the fact that u rejects g at w tells me something about u at w plus minus 100. Do I get some information about u at uh, w plus minus a million? I get something from concavity, but not enough. So it's very hard to always, to always get that when g is rejected, h is rejected. Okay? 
So here is the next idea. OK, G is rejected. OK, we don't have to make a big fuss out of that. OK, unless G is rejected in a substantive way. Then if there is just one rejection by some U at some W of G, OK, you know, maybe this guy is crazy. Who knows? OK, but let's see. If there is significant rejection, that's when we should start asking that whatever happens to G should happen to H and even more. OK, so the next idea is to say the following. We are going to ask, OK, so we are going to translate this into uniform rejection, namely rejection not just in one case, one U and W, but over a whole range of problems. Now, since a pr decision problem is characterized by two things, a U and a W, a utility and a wealth, we can do this very easily two ways. We can do uniformity on U, and we can do uniformity on W. OK, what do I mean by that? So let's start with uniformity on W. So now I'm going to translate this sentence that risk averse decision makers are less averse to G than to H by saying that G is rejected less than H in the wealth uniform sense. What do I mean by that? I mean, if it happens that G is, sorry, if it happens that G is rejected by a certain U at all wealth levels, not just at one wealth level, no matter what the wealth is, then that means that serious rejection. Then I want the same to happen for H. So in, in, the, in the sense of this very strong uniform rejection, I want H to be more rejected than G. Okay? Now, if you don't like words, then there are formulas which say exactly the same. Now, for the logicians, they will realize that what I did, I essentially took the all from here and moved it here and duplicated it. It appears twice. But yes, so if this sentence holds for all W, then this sentence should hold for all W. So clearly, it's an extension of the previous one, because the previous one hold, held for each W separately. OK? That's an easy exercise. Do it in the morning, not now. OK? But uh, so this is some extension of the, of the previous order. So it's an extension of stochastic dominance. And this I'm calling Wells uniform domination. WU stands for Wells uniform. You don't have to remember that. And you can do the other thing, uniform on Wells. Sorry, uniform on Wells I did, so uniform on utility. So uniform on utility says G is rejected less than H in the utility uniform sense if for every Wells W, if it happens that G is rejected at that W not just by one U, but all U's, then the same should happen for H. Okay? So again, this is an extension of the previous order and of stochastic dominance. And uh, okay, you want to see the formula. So again, it's just changing the order of the quantifiers. And we have uniform domination. Okay? So to summarize what, what we have, okay? So I'm, de I'm, I'm defining the concept that G is less risky than H by saying that G is rejected less than H. Rejected in what sense? Well, rejected could be just one single rejection, and then you get what I call the acceptance dominance. Or it could be a uniform rejection over all wealth levels, that's W, or it could be uniform rejection by all U at a certain W. So those are three options. Okay? But they all follow the same logic. Okay? And notice that the way those things are ordered, so that's the order between orders, uh, stochastic dominance implies acceptance dominance and implies each one of these two uniform orders. So both these orders are some extension of stochastic dominance. Okay? Clear up to now? Okay, good. Okay, the result. Here are the results of the jury. Yes. Uh, so, wealth uniform, I have two orders. Wealth uniform dominance and utility uniform dominance. Wealth uniform dominance is a complete order. Any two gamblers can be compared. Okay? For any G and H, either G, W dominates in the, in the wealth uniform sense H, or H dominates G in the wealth uniform sense. Stochastic dominance and acceptance dominance were very partial orders. Remember, most gamblers you cannot compare. These are complete orders. Any pair can be compared. It's quite a surprise. How about utility, uni utility uniform dominance? It's also a complete order. Now, just to dispel any thoughts, it's not the same. Those orders are different. Okay? They are related, but they are not the same. Okay? So th there's a limit to the number of surprises. You know. <laughs> okay? So, uh, okay. Now, what are these orders? So it turns out that these orders have, in fact, a neat each one of them has a neat representation in terms of some new indices or measures of riskiness that have been introduced in the literature in the last few years. Okay? 
And namely, Wells uniform dominance is equivalent to the order induced by the aumann serrano index of riskiness. I'll tell you in a moment a little about what that is. Uh, so the aumann serrano index of riskiness takes each gamble and associates to it a number. And the bigger the number, the more risky it is, according to aumann serrano OK? And Wells uniform dominance exactly represents this order. So G dominates H, which means G is less risky if the riskiness of G, according to Aumann Serrano, is less than the riskiness of H, according to Aumann Serrano. Okay, so you have a neat representation of this order. We can associate a number to each gamble, and that number will tell me which one is going to be less risky or more risky. Okay, very nice. How about uh, utility uniform dominance? It's equivalent to another measure, namely the Foster Hart measure of riskiness. Uh, and you get exactly the same kind of inequality that says that G utility uniformly dominates H if and only if the riskiness of G according to Foster Hart is less than the riskiness of H according to Foster Hart. Okay? Now, what are these measures or indices? I mean, there is a reason one is called an index, the other a measure, but I'm not going to get into this. You are invited to read the papers, Alman Serrano, Foster Hart, uh, and uh, other things. So let me tell you what this is. So let's start with Aumann Serrano. Uh, this is the Aumann Serrano index. What do I mean by that? I mean by that the following. Put here, here, put an X, OK? Instead of this uh, thing, RAS of G, put an X. And look at this as an equation in X. So take a gamble G, which is a random variable, multiply it, or take a, take a positive number X, multiply G by 1 over X, put a minus sign in front, take E to the power, subtract 1, it's still a random variable, and then compute expectation. I want this to be 0. Now, this is, this is clearly monotonic in x. It's easy to see that this equation has a unique solution, which is exactly this number, right? Except that this is not monotonic in x. I do this every time, and nobody realizes it. This is not monotonic in x because, remember, g can have positive and negative values. So it's not true that this is monotonic. However, it's a nice enough, enough function that after some transformation, one can realize one can prove that it has a unique intersection with zero, OK? But uh, it's a little more delicate. One has to go to second order effects. Uh, never mind. Anyway, this equation for every g has a unique solution, which is exactly this number. So it's determined here. How about the foster Hart measure? Well, it's pretty similar, except that there is a different formula. So there is here a number y, which is by unknown, and which is uniquely determined, I claim, by this equation. Take g, take 1 over yg, add 1, take log, expectation. <coughs> now, this looks very different, but they are not so different, by the way. If you look at the Taylor series of those two functions, they are the same up to the third term. That's the first time they differ. OK? There, there are lots of other proper, uh, uh, similar nice things here. But now, OK, what does this mean? What is this? OK? Uh, what? Ten more minutes, OK? Uh, it's a problem. I told, I told the norm I'll finish in 20. <laughs> OK. I'll finish in 25. OK. Uh, OK. So what, are this, uh, what, what is the interpretation of this? So here it says something. Let me explain. So let's talk about the Amman Serrano index of riskiness. Now, uh, um, when I look, so we said that risk aversion corresponds to a utility function that is concave. Yes, that's con increasing and concave is like this. I mean, I'm drawing it the way you see it. Yes? I hope so. Yes, that's <laughs> OK. Now, what does it mean that some decision maker is more risk averse than another? It just means that the function is more curved. Somebody who is risk neutral has a linear utility function. He is exactly indifferent between the expectation and the, uh, between the gamble and the expectation. It just means that the utility is linear, linear function. The more curved the function is, the more bent the function is, the more risk averse the decision maker is. How do we measure that? Well, bentness or curvature is second derivative, yes? So second derivative is going to tell us that. But there is a problem. If I take a utility function and multiply by 7 for any positive 7, nothing changes in the problem. Everything is multiplied by 7, so acceptance is acceptance, rejection is rejection, just comparing. But the second derivative gets multiplied by 7. So how can I compare? I don't have a unit there, OK? So it turns out that one has to be a little more sophisticated. And instead of taking the second derivative, and in fact, it's the absolute value of the second derivative because second derivative for concave function is negative. That's a curvature. You take the second derivative, divide by the first derivative. 
That has the advantage that multiplying by 7, the 7 cancels, cancels out. That's not the only advantage. And in fact, in the 70s, uh, uh, Ken Arrow and John Pratt in parallel developed this measure, which turned out to have zillions of beautiful properties. Okay? It's a right measure that really captures the degree of risk aversion of a utility function. And that's u double prime or minus u double prime over u prime. Okay? So, uh, okay, I mean, again, if you've never seen this, it sounds like magic. It's not, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing through this. So now I can ask the following question. Look, I'm giving you gamble g. Somebody who is this neutral clearly will accept it because this is positive expectation. So I'm going to start bending the utility function until they will stop accepting it. And I'm going to ask when, for which utility function, there is exactly the, the, the switch from acceptance to rejection. That's going to be the critical curvature, the critical degree of risk aversion, which is exactly measured by the arrow path. And then you get this thing, which is probably unreadable. So don't read it, but just remember what I said. I mean, read it when you read the full paper. Anyway, uh, this exactly says that, that the aumann serrano index of riskiness is 1 over the critical coefficient according to Errol Pratt. So it really captures the critical risk aversion where the switch from acceptance to rejection occurs. Okay? Roughly speaking. Not roughly, quite precisely, but I don't want to get into this. I mean, I don't have the time. Uh, how about the foster heart measure? The foster heart measure has the following property. So suppose you keep getting gambles every day. And remember, you can say no to gambles. So the question is, what kind of strategies are going to guarantee that you're not going to go bankrupt? There is one easy strategy. Never accept any gamble. Okay? That works. But can you accept some gambles? You know, remember, those are positive expectations. So, you know, once in a while, maybe a little, you know. Maybe you want to make money also, not just to stay put. Okay? So it turns out that for every gamble, there is a certain critical wealth level with the following property. At that wealth level, there is a change of regime. If you accept gambles when your wealth is below that, you may go bankrupt. In fact, there will be sequences of gambles that will make you get bankrupt for sure. On the other hand, if you only accept when you are above, you are never going to go bankrupt no matter what gambles you are going to face. There is really a big change of regime, a significant change there. And one can talk about bankruptcy, one can talk about making money versus losing money, one can talk about any criterion you want, you're going to get exactly the same answer, which is exactly this foster heart number. Okay? Read the paper. Okay? <laughs> okay. So, uh, going back to what I said, uh, the Amman Serrano index gives us the critical risk aversion. One over, doesn't matter, but it's related to the critical risk aversion. Because we do uniformity on wealth, so we get the critical utility. Foster Hart does uniform utility, so we're going to get the critical wealth. Okay? But each one of those has, has nice interpretations and lots of work that has been done around axiomatization and approaches. Surprisingly enough, I mean, they look completely different. One is uniform utility, the other is uniform on wealth, the one is uh, e to the power, the other is log and so on. Many times they're very, very similar. In fact, there is a theorem saying that when riskiness is relatively high, they are almost the same. The ratio goes to one. Okay? But they come from very different worlds. Okay? So uh, I think that's uh, okay. So this is now the summary of the result. Yes, so we now have stochastic dominance. We extend that through this intermediate step to these two uniform orders, which are complete and have beautiful representations in terms of those two new riskiness measures. Okay? And now I promised you technical details now to make the theorem correct. Okay? So a gamble G, what's, what are the objects we studied? Those are real valued random variables okay? uh, with positive expectation and positive probability of having losses. As I said, those are the interesting cases. The others have infinite or zero riskiness, and they are not. So they are trivially this. Finally, many values is just to get rid of epsilons and deltas and so on. Utility functions. What's a utility function? A utility function is a function from R plus to R. We are talking about positive amounts of money. Okay? If you can't get loans, put them in and move the zero to the worst, you know, the minimum you can be. Okay? This is error. Error 65, yes? 60, 65, right? I mean, this is classic, yes? I'm not inventing anything new here. Strictly increasing and concave. And Negative. There is no negative wealth. 
you, no, you can, you can, look, I can move the whole thing. You want this to go to from minus 100? No problem. I mean, it's still concave. What's the problem? Concave is concave. Negative, positive, who cares? There's no problem with that. Concave. Sorry, for you, concave. <laughs> concave enough. <laughs> concave, I mean, you want the zero to be here or here? That's completely irrelevant. Concavity has nothing to do when you put the origin. Why concave? Risk aversion. That I explained to you. Risk aversion. You always prefer, you always prefer the average to the gamble. That's what it says. Concave. Okay. Take the average. This is better than this. But beyond zero, is it like that? No. It continues to be concave if you can go beyond zero. Yes. But in fact, you won't be. The, we'll see in a moment. I, I'm not going to allow you to go beyond zero. Okay. But uh, okay. So uh, since we are talking about uniformity, we need some assumptions because if you allow anything, then uniformity are going to get an empty set. So we are going to make two assumptions, which turns out are exactly the assumptions that Arrow proposed in '65. I always say, you know, Ken is a very smart guy. He already knew what is needed in 2010. Okay? So what are these assumptions that he, that he proposed then? Uh, I, I'll say them different than he said. One says rejection increases with wealth. Decreases, sorry. So you have more money, you accept more and reject less. Okay? Uh, formally, what he says is that if you reject G at wealth W, then you reject at any smaller wealth. Whenever you are poorer, for sure you are going to reject the same gamble. Okay? Now, this turns out to have a beautiful characterization in terms of utility functions, which is called decreasing absolute risk aversion. The error Pratt coefficient that you saw, and I never explained it well enough, is decreasing. That turns out to be exactly equivalent. It's a beautiful class of utility functions. Okay? The other condition that I need okay, is that rejection increases with scale, which means Look, maybe now I can, uh, this gamble, uh, this gamble, this wealth is okay, but now if all the numbers become millions, I, well, uh, wait a minute, you know. I may, be, I may be willing to lose $10, but not 10 millions. Okay? So this says that when the scale goes up, then the rejection can only go up. Okay? This turns out to be equivalent to the first condition of arrow, which is increasing relative risk aversion. Okay? Uh, now, I need one more condition in addition to those two, namely, that's a condition on the utility function, namely that when you give a gamble, if you are poor enough, you are going to reject it. Can't be that you are going to accept gambles no matter how poor you are. Okay? Now, that puts a certain limitation on the utility functions. And if you want, you know, the, the, the idea is, look, if somebody is going to accept a gamble no matter what, it's not enough risk averse to be a good test, uh, you know, to give me testimony about risk aversion. It's, it's too lenient, yes? I need the tough guys here, yes? But again, this is a story. Uh, okay, this turns out to be equivalent to the fact that when you go to zero, the utility goes to minus infinity. Okay? Now, if you take all these conditions, uh, if you take all these conditions, then every, all the theorem becomes correct. In fact, I don't need all these conditions. I need this condition, I need the first condition for the first order, I need this for the second order, but it's much neater at least I like, to have just one beautiful class of utilities over which everything is done and not to adapt the set of utilities to the theorem. But rather have one world when you do everything. And that's the way which is done. And I think that my time is up, right? Put your time sign up and uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I do. Okay, uh, some open questions. Yes, uh, you want to? Yes, I have in fact quite a few. Uh, he's the boss. Uh, yes, you. Yeah. No, no, no. Now you can ask me, but but uh, to ask whether you can ask, you can ask. You have to ask him. Yes. Yes. For good reason. Yes. <laughs> no, but, but no, you raised an important point, which in fact, you know, I, I mean, I have more slides, which usually, you know, in a game tour, uh, no, no, in economic audiences, I go that. Yes, no. Uh, it's very important to understand what I'm talking here is about an objective measure of riskiness, not a subjective, I mean, measures, there are two of those, yes? Those are objective measures of riskiness. Subjective, I mean, if you have your own utility function, of course, you evaluate gambles and you know what you prefer G to H. That's not what I'm talking about. This measure is something that associates to every gamble a number. Gamble means I just look at the outcomes and probabilities, nothing else. And that number is an objective number, exactly like if you, I'm asking you, what is the return of the gamble, the expectation? 
Doesn't matter what your utility function is, the expectation of the gamble is always the same. If I ask you what is the variance of the gamble, of the spread, you know, if you come from finance, they say spread. What's the spread of the gamble? Well, it's a standard deviation. Again, it's what's the kurtosis? Okay. So it's exactly, it's a parameter of the distribution. Okay? Riskiness is exactly like expectation or variance or various moments of the distribution is a certain parameter of the distribution, which is an objective measure. It doesn't depend on your utility function. We use people with utility functions to ask them questions, but once they reply to me and I saw that this implies that, go home. Now I have my answer, which is independent of you. And don't mean you, I mean you as utility functions. <laughs> okay? So again, I'm emphasizing these are objective measures, not subjective. Okay? This is done in the world, as I said, of Neumann Augustine, the classic expected utility world. Of course, one can start extending it. You want to go to prospect theory, you want to go to non expected utility, to uncertainty, ambiguity, you know, whatever. Those things are extendable, at least, I mean, they start to be extended. One can talk about similar things, but we start from the very, very simple case and classical case. Okay? Is that. Uh, Positive, positive. Uh, and not a stochastic variable. And not? No. Yeah, not a no. Variable. no. So, uh, uh, but the script, uh, if you say that uh, one gamble uh, dominates another, then uh, it does not mean that in any situation I will prefer this to this. Because it's Look, if you have for all W, then clearly you have also if you have, if over W have a distribution, because the expectation of that is bigger than, the expectation of inequalities is the same inequality. I haven't said anything, anything smart now, yes? But, uh, so whatever, when you do uniformity on W, yes, doesn't matter. If it's true for each W, it's true also when W, you, you take an random a probability distribution over W, just average inequalities. Ah, okay, okay, no, no, but that's, but then it's, uh, yeah, but no, no. If you get into this world, that's much too complicated. Then uh, I want to be in a simple world where I can make comparisons, you know, it's already very tough to compare, I mean. But uh, it makes sense only if G is independent. Yeah, look, you are, with, you, you, with utility U, are here now with Wells W. You have G and H, what do you prefer? What do you take? Do you accept G? Do you accept H? It's a good question. Yes, now you can ask the question, well, suppose I don't know what my wealth is. Okay, you know, okay, you don't know, you don't know. I mean, go and find out. No, 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 I, I mean, the, I, what I'm saying is, sure, you can complicate everything, but, uh, you know, we want some place where you can get answers. If you make it complicated enough, you're never going to get any answer, and then you go back and say, look, I can't compare anything because it's too complicated, and you go back to stochastic dominance, which gives us very little uh, information. It's okay, but uh, you know the nice thing is to find to, to put some some to, to, to put some meat inside, yes, to get something and get a real answer, yes. That's all. But sure, I mean there are limitations here. I agree. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>